Montgomery. Right. And, uh, has done the Living Legacy Project uh, trip through Mississippi. So uh, I, I alerted her to this opportunity. Well, and, welcome, Jackie. <laughs> thank you so much. And we really are looking forward to another, a real trip to Selma. <laughs> <laughs> Could that happen? Someday. I haven't figured out when yet, but uh, it will happen. Thank you. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> when, whenever Gordon starts, if everyone could mute themselves, um, that would be great. Just so, just, just so we can keep uh, make sure Gordon's the main uh, presenter at that point. <laughs> so, just let me know whenever you want to start, Gordon. Okay. Um, I think I know well, you, Jackie. Think... So I'm just saying hi. Yes. I think we were on the trip together. Yes. Okay, let's uh, let's get rolling and if other people join in, you know, they can pick up wherever we are. So Okay. So, this is time travel back to Selma, Alabama as of 1965. Uh, when I went to Selma, um, the first week of February 1965, I took a camera along. Actually, it was Judy's camera, but um, <coughs> um, I had married Judy by that point, so okay, it was our camera. Um, now, February 65 was a month before Bloody Sunday, the Selma event that so many of us know about, and before the attack that fatally injured Jim Reeb, and before the shooting of Viola Liuzzo. We who are Unitarian Universalists talk a lot about Jim Reeb and Viola Liuzzo. And realistically, it, it was the, the, the fatal attack on Jim Reeb, a white minister who had come from Boston to Selma, that really, well, that provoked uh, the address to the nation by President Johnson, in which he said that uh, the struggle for voting rights, the, the obstruction of voting rights, something that we needed to overcome and we shall overcome. Uh, but it's very important to remember there was another death connected to the Selma events. Jimmy Lee Jackson, a black Baptist deacon, just a year older, probably just a few months older than I was, the shooting of Jimmy Lee Jackson by a state trooper in Marion, Alabama a shooting that resulted in his death a week or so later, was the whole reason for a march from Selma to Montgomery. So let's remember all those people and see these images from Selma. Selma was a small city, maybe more realistically, a large town with block after block of lovely houses like these, many of them dating back into the 19th century, some of them antebellum prior to the Civil War. Notice the, you know, nicely paved streets, broad tree lawns, leading up to sidewalks, uh, just, you know, a, I'm a, saying a, a remarkably pretty town. 
Gordon, I, I hate to interrupt, but we're not able to see your screen. Ah, okay. Well, I'm not sure what is going on here. Let's uh, let's see what. Try what it. I, try it now. Okay. Did that get it there? Or do I need to hit share screen? Hit share screen again. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That should get us there. When you hit share screen, there it goes. Okay. I was going to say, sometimes you need to um, pick what image you're sharing then. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's an image, there's an image of Selma, but Selma also has other different neighborhoods. And do we really need to spell out which neighborhood is a white neighborhood and which was a black neighborhood. Ah, notice we do not have broad tree lawns here. We don't have pavement here. We don't have storm sewers here. We don't have curb. Ah, no. Changes have come to Selma since 1965. With the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, Mayor Joe Smitherman realized he needed to do some things for the black community, which was now a voting community. And he started bringing improvements such as storm sewers and paving. Two black neighborhoods. Ironic, it's not with local tax money, but with federal funds. And those neighborhood improvements and finding ways to divide the black vote kept Smitherman in power for over 30 more years. So the next image is the house where the Reverend Ira Blaylock and I were hosted while we were in Selma. This is on Lawrence Avenue. 20 years after this picture was taken, I was back in Selma briefly. Our 12 year old daughter and I were passing through on our way to Atlanta for the UUA General Assembly. And we did a couple of things. I, I located the grave of my ancestor. I think I figured out great, great, great grandmother uh, in the Live Oak Cemetery. And we stopped by this house and the lovely woman who had very graciously hosted Ira and me was still there. She was out in the backyard. We greeted, we hugged. And I, it had to have been on that occasion that she confessed that when her son headed out to go to a, a mass meeting at Brown Chapel that night, she told him, now, don't you go bringing home some civil rights worker for me to house, and certainly not a white one. So he followed her directions. He came home with two white ones. And her face did not show, certainly it was, she, she was a wonderful host for the two of us. So that's 
the residential situation, but you know, retail spaces also were not equal or remotely equivalent. This is the view down Broad Street in 1965. In the distance, in the distance, you can see the Edmund Pettus Bridge across the Alabama River, where a month after this Bloody Sunday occurred, civil rights marchers crested that bridge and saw a sea of blue helmets on the other side. Now, Broad Street has changed. The, uh, the Albert Hotel here on the left was torn down. It's been replaced by city offices. Uh, you see a Sears sign on the right. <laughs> Sears no longer has an outlet in Selma. And, you know, frankly, there are vacancies along Broad Street. Selma has not thrived economically, but there's still significant buildings along here. This was the, the white business district. This block, in contrast, had black businesses. On the left in this image here is Walker's Cafe. That's where Jim Reeb, Orloff Miller, and Clark Olson had dinner on the night that they were attacked as they walked back from Walker's Cafe to Brown Chapel and the church. Over Ira Blaylock and I had dinner there one night. But Southern towns mix people together. Out of this picture, on the left, at the end of this city block, was the Silver Moon Cafe. What was the Silver Moon Cafe? That was a clan hangout. The South is complex. Don't ever let somebody tell you the South is simple. So, Selma made national headlines in 1965 because outsiders, Dr. King especially, came in to support longstanding local efforts. Uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had been working in Selma since early 1963. So both outside assistance and long-term local organizing were important ingredients in achieving results. So here are some of the figures from 1965. At the pulpit in Brown Chapel, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Seated behind him, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, his longtime friend and associate. They worked together in Montgomery. They moved to Atlanta. Uh, Ralph Abernathy shortly after Dr. King. And then uh, the Reverend F.D. Reese and Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's beautiful and extremely intelligent wife. So three, three outsiders and the Reverend F.D. Reese, a local leader. Also coming to <coughs> Selma was Malcolm X, brought there by SNCC. With Dr. King in jail, when SNCC brought uh, Malcolm X in. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization, brought in Coretta Scott King and the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth to give some competing star power and try to offset any focus on Malcolm. Malcolm spoke 
here in Brown Chapel, immediately after him, Coretta Scott King spoke. And I cherish the picture I took of him listening intently and respectfully to her. And then Fred Shuttlesworth, firebrand preacher who had served a congregation in Birmingham. Fred Shuttlesworth wasn't just brave. Fred was, Fred Shuttlesworth was crazy brave. And here he is in the pulpit, and behind him, Malcolm X and Coretta Scott King conversing. I'm sure these three people were together only this time in this spot. Two and a half weeks later, Malcolm X was assassinated. And that cut off opportunities that he was cultivating for him and his organization to collaborate with Dr. King and with SNCC. Maybe <clears throat> more about that when we uh, converse later on. Here in the pulpit is the Reverend F.D. Reese. Reverend F.D. Reese was pastor of a local church. He also taught in the school system. It was part of the, an officer in the Dallas County Voters League. Digress to a couple of observations here. Uh, one is something I learned a few years later while I was serving a congregation in Jackson, Mississippi. A black man who attended our church from time to time explained to me why he and other black men would sometimes choose to go by FD or whatever their set of initials were. He said that way nobody can call you Bill or Billy. So the Reverend Mr. Reese chose to go by FD, probably for reasons including that. But it's also interesting to notice, as I've begun to, sometimes these, these names tell us something. What might FD stand for? In this case, Frederick Douglass. The Reverend FD Reese was not the first generation in his family to be conscious of the struggle for freedom. I had a colleague in Jackson, Mississippi, Wendell P. Taylor, Wendell Phillips Taylor. So this picture, we have the Reverend F.D. Reese, a local leader behind him, Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And this is another key longtime local leader, Mrs. Amelia Boynton, along with F.D. Reese an officer of the Dallas County Voters League. Notice the beautifully coordinated sweater set and the gloves she is wearing. This is a lady, just in case you have any question about it. This is a lady. And she is someone through whom one can trace many po key points of civil rights history. As Amelia Platts, she came to Selma as home demonstration agent, working for the agriculture department. 
part. A few years later, she married Samuel Blyton, her male counterpart who worked with farmers. And in 1936, with five others, the Boytons restarted the Dallas County Voters League. Focused on the vote that early. The, the work of the 1950s and 60s didn't start from zero. It built on decades of work within the Black community. 1937, the Boynton's son, Bruce, was born. A few years later, they started an insurance agency, which gave them uh, some additional work to do and, and additional or alternative income stream. I think they left their uh, USDA work. In 1958, Bruce Boynton, then a student at Howard University Law School, was arrested in Richmond, Virginia, for sitting in the white section of the Greyhound Station. He was represented by Thurgood Marshall, and they appealed the case all the way to the Supreme Court in 1960. In Boynton versus Virginia, the Supreme Court voted seven to two that all facilities in interstate travel must be open to all travelers without regard to race. The Freedom Rides the next year tested whether this ruling was being enforced. In 1963, after SNCC had come to Selma, Samuel Boynton died and Amelia Boynton agreed to let SNCC turn his funeral service at Tabernacle Baptist Church into Dallas County's first mass meeting for civil rights. In 1964, Amelia Boynton, on behalf of the Dallas County Voters League, invited Dr. King and the Southern Christian leadership to join the civil rights struggle in Dallas County. March 7th, of 65, Amelia Boynton was one of the hundreds assaulted and injured on Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. 50 years later to the day, on the 50th anniversary observance of Bloody Sunday, Amelia Platts Boynton Robinson crossed the Pettus Bridge on which she had been beaten 50 years earlier, among those taking a turn, pushing her wheelchair, was President Barack Obama. Yes, this one person's life spanned so much of the civil rights movement. Well, here is a demonstration in front of the Dallas County Courthouse. Some of the ingredients of the Selma movement. Children demonstrate as one of Dr. King's uh, lieutenants, uh, Jim Bevel observed, if you're born black in Selma, you're born in jail. It's just a question of which side of the bars you're on. You're in jail. So even the children, you can see on the left side of the picture, members of the press observing the demonstration, taking notes. I th think this is an Alabama state trooper might be a sheriff's deputy, but I think it's a state trooper. And the bus, the bus is there to haul, haul demonstrators to jail. Now, these kids are black. They didn't get school bus rides to school. The school bus they met only took them to jail. 
Okay, later on, there, were, there was an adult demonstration at the courthouse. Over here on the extreme left, there is an NBC news camera going along to record what happened. The press was very important. And here, the adults have gathered at the colored entrance to the courthouse. There were separate entrances. And on the steps of the courthouse, the Reverend C.T. Vivian, who died just last year in his mid 90s. C.T. Vivian confronted Sheriff Jim Clark and the camera is there recording it. Over here on the left, there's a red helmet, closer look there. Same scene, C.T. Vivian and Sheriff Clark in the background, but now focused on one of the men deputized by Sheriff Clark. And let's take a still closer look. Let's look at how the deputy is equipped. Hanging from the left side of his belt is a cattle prod. If you have a cow that doesn't want to move, this could persuade several hundred pounds of cow to start moving. And there's a billy club, a rather large billy club, and something, presumably a holster containing a gun, is strapped on to his right hip. All this was needed to cope with a nonviolent demonstration. This demonstration was, I believe, on a Friday. My colleague, the Reverend Ira Waylock, chose to take part and was arrested in this demonstration. I was not yet <coughs> ready to demonstrate. So I went along with my camera. Another demonstration was announced for the following Tuesday. Now, bolstered by the fact that previous demonstration demonstrators, in this Friday one, had been released on their personal recognizance. Both Ira and I part, took part in that Tuesday demonstration, but we found the rules of the game had changed. That group of demonstrators was arrested, booked, mm -hmm. tried, convicted of contempt of court, and each of us was sentenced to five days in jail and a $50 fine. The fine isn't paid to be worked off at $3 a day at hard labor. We served seven days of the five-day sentence. And I have to say that the trial was very efficient. The judge was uh, the judge, assistant prosecutor, and prosecution witness. Uh, I believe an attorney did show up before they'd finished sentencing us. So this is after our time in jail. I alerted a couple of TVUC people that they might want to tune in here. I uh, don't know if Jeff and Susan Kovac and uh, Pat Bing have been able to tune in. The picture shows Chuck Fager of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference staff uh, and my colleague, the Reverend Ira Blaylock, standing in front of Brown Chapel AME Church after our release from jail. Chuck had oh, been in jail, his time in jail overlapping with ours. He was released a little bit earlier than we were. And one of Chuck's responsibilities uh, for SCLC was 
public relations. So he arranged for Ira and me to go downtown to be photographed with Dr. King, who was observing people who were at the courthouse, I think signing the appearance book and protesting that it was even there. So. I see it, we're here. Hey. Hey. Tell us why you might recognize Chuck Fager. He and I were friends in college. And, and he kept in touch, we kept in touch after he used to call me from Selma and, <laughs> and tell me and whisper, I had a, over the phone, what was going on. So. Yes, uh, Chuck, uh, you know, we'll talk a little more about Chuck later. <laughs> this is the picture that resulted from uh, Chuck's getting us downtown. Looking at it years later, I was fascinated to realize Dr. King wasn't six feet tall. I th no. I think of him as huge because he was a huge presence, but he was only a person of average height. Um, it was the personality that was huge, not the stat, not the physical stature. And recently, I've realized this picture is a good demonstration of white supremacy. Because at this point in the Selma struggle, hundreds of people, probably over a thousand people, had been arrested. I don't think there were AP wire photos of any of them. Maybe I think a photo of Mrs. Boynton being hustled down the sidewalk by Sheriff Clark did run, but none of the average folks who were arrested had their picture taken with Dr. King because we were white. Yes, we were photographable, transmittable. Now, this was a use by Dr. King and SCLC of that reality. They were using white supremacy, the fact that Ira and I were different, we were noteworthy. They used that to fight white supremacy. But that doesn't alter the fact that yes, we stood out because of whiteness. So that's the last of the last of the photos I want to share. So Gordon can, Gordon, Lily yes. and Ashburn. Uh, who were the two tall white men in the picture behind you all? Do you know? Uh, I, I don't know names. Uh, they were journalists. Um, I think maybe one from uh, Washington Post, but I'm not sure. So, yeah, don't have names. Okay, other questions, comments? Uh, there's no mention of John Lewis, who uh, led the march on well, Bloody Sunday. We were late getting in. Yeah, we were late getting in here. Yep. Well, I, you know, I don't know whether John Lewis and I were in Selma and on the loose at the same time. Um, and John Lewis was not. Um, I think he was in the Very hospital guy. after the after Bloody Sunday. Very briefly in the hospital after Bloody Sunday. Before. This was this was a month before Bloody Sunday. 
So he may well have been there. Um, Judy and I met John Lewis when he spoke for the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee at a General Assembly a few years ago. Uh, the Williams family and the Chris, two Gibsons been, uh, got front row seats so <laughs> we could that's, that's maybe a, speak with John Lewis. Virtual, then they, even though there's a person. Yeah. And um, when, you know, I think, I think Judy and I had all of about 45 seconds to chat with John because he, you know, there were scores of people who really, really wanted to see John Lewis and get him to autograph something. Uh, he and I did establish an odd civil rights sort of kinship. We both spent time sleeping on the hard, cold, concrete floor of Camp Selma. Uh, camp Selma was a state highway road camp. Typically, uh, they had state convicts housed there and, you know, had them out working on, not sure it was a uh, chain gang, but it was um, you know, highway work that's supervised by somebody toting a shotgun. Um, but they had cleared the state uh, state prisoners out of there uh, to make room for civil rights arrestees. And um, they didn't want a civil rights scum to um, mess things up for the regular prisoners. So they piled the mattresses out in the hallway took the metal bed frames, they were stacked up outside. And, uh, you know, John Lewis and I agreed that cold, hard concrete floor was not a real comfortable sleeping surface. But yeah, at different times, we had both been there. So it's an interesting sort of kinship. Um, hopping back to Chuck Fager, uh, Pat, I remember that uh, you commented that he had urged you into activism on campus. Uh, yeah. And it didn't I was take a lot to urge me, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean you've been this way a long time? <laughs> He was my campaign manager when I ran for a student body president at, <laughs> at Colorado State. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, a few years ago, he published a book, uh, Eating Dr. King's Dinner, which has a marvelous, the title story is a marvelous one. Uh, I was interested in reading it because in it, he blames or credits, I'm not sure which, me with radicalizing him. I thought it meant <laughs> in the other direction. So uh, it's interesting. I see Chris, Chris asked the question, did I have any encounters with C.T. Vivian? Uh, I don't remember direct conversations with him. I certainly saw him in action. Uh, I have another picture that I didn't include here. Uh, he was speaking to a, a gathering down the street from Brown Chapel at First Baptist Church uh, that SNCC had organized. And he, he was a marvelously organized and forceful speaker. Um, and then, uh, in recent years, um, Judy and I encountered C.T. Vivian when uh, Harold Middlebrook brought him to Knoxville and we shared uh, the experience of having been in Selma at the same time. And then uh, for the 50th anniversary of Selma, uh, Living Legacy Project organized the Unitarian Universalist 
observance of that. And C.T. Vivian is one of the people we brought in for one of those sessions. And he was, I think he was 91 years old at that point and still sharp as a tack, just an, an amazing, uh, amazing mind, an amazing human being. Oh. I've got a question, Gordon. Sure. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. You know, a few years ago, uh, you came to one of my RE classes and talked about it. And um, I remember asking you, you know, how, how did you get the courage to go? And you said something like, someone had told you, um, only go if going is more important than coming back. Yes. And that was really powerful. And then, um, you know, er earlier you mentioned that uh, you weren't yet ready to protest, to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about, you know, you went there knowing that it was more important to go than to come back. But when you were there, you weren't yet ready to demonstrate. And so I'm just curious about the state of mind mm -hmm. in these days and hours and minutes or whatever, how, you know, as you're, as you're trying to figure out how to, what to do. <laughs> yes, Jeff, good questions and sharp memory. Uh, I'm, I'm not used to people actually paying attention to what I say. <laughs> and, and, and you got an almost exact quote. You know, the person who told me, don't go unless it's more important that you go and let you come back was Orloff Miller. A few years older than, than I, he was the minister who uh, helped Judy and me write our wedding ceremony. And he would have officiated, but well, uh, had to be at the March on Washington instead. Uh, long, long story there, but Orloff was someone I knew well, respected, and he saw that I wasn't maybe being serious enough about going to Selma. So he said, don't go, unless it's more important that you go than that you come back. Ironically, I was not, as far as I know, in great danger at any time. A month after I was in Selma, Orloff was there he was the person walking right next to Jim Reeb when Reeb, Orloff, and uh, Clark were attacked. He was roughed up, but Jim took the brunt of the attack. Uh, irony. If you have no sense of irony, you can't do this history. What happened with me, I understood that Ira and I had been asked by the Unitarian Universalist Association to go observe and report back as to whether there was space, there was a place in this work for Unitarian Universalists to volunteer. So I went with an observer mentality. Um, at the time of that uh, Friday demonstration, I, I, I still had that mentality. Um, Ira was several years older than I, several years more mature than I, and I think got past observing <laughs> faster than I did. I, I, Ira had been an officer in the Marine Corps uh, when he served in the Jacksonville, uh, Florida area, he made uh, virtually simultaneous discoveries of Unitarian Universalism and pacifism. And as, he, as Ira put it, using his Marine Corps vocabulary. For a Marine to discover pacifism is kind of misplaced. Well, as he put it, the Marine Corps is a hell of a place for a pacifist. So... <laughs> You know, I, I shifted gears into demonstrating faster than Gordon did. 
I discovered talking with him after we were uh, jailed, or maybe even after we got home, as we walked downtown to the courthouse and the demonstration we both took part in, you know, I was looking around at who was, he said, you know, I was checking the high points for any metallic glints. He was using his Marine Corps uh, training to say, okay, are we going to get as far as the courthouse? Um, I think what changed me was seeing, observing that, yes, it was important. People, almost all the people demonstrating were solar residents. When they demonstrated, they were putting everything on the line. Their lives, okay, that applied to us too. But their homes, unless they own their home outright, free and clear title, and maybe even then, their jobs, or if, they, if it was a kid, maybe their parents' jobs, if they worked for someone white or worked for a black person indebted to white people, they could be fired like that. I didn't have any of that at risk. It was time for me to get out of my comfort zone and demonstrate. So, yeah. Jordan, Lillian again. Interesting, interestingly, uh, the Union Presbytery, which was the Northern Presbytery here in Knoxville, integrated in late 50s, maybe 58, somewhere in that time period. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had a youth group meeting at, well, I can't remember what was first United or just United. Church, Presbyterian Church on the campus of Knoxville College. Hmm. And the minister's last name was Reese, <laughs> which I find, found interesting. But um, um, we had clergy from um, the Presbytery. We had some churches in Northern Alabama had uh, were United Presbyterian, what, what is now United Presbyterian, but part of the uh, uh, Northern Presbytery, and so they were going down to inspect the minutes and do the normal presbyterial things. And minister from Oak Ridge and one of the other ministers from Knoxville, and um, as they were leaving, headed back and told not to don't stop. Once you leave this church, these churches, do not stop for any reason till you cross the state lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were stopped and uh, attacked, beaten pretty severely. And um, uh, some of the um, black people evidently were aware of what was going on and took them to the hospital, which did not want to treat them. And so they had to take, take although these were white men, had to take them back across the state lines uh, for treatment. And uh, um, so it was it was a risky risky time. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting times. Interesting times. The movie, the 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 documentary Eyes on the Prize and the Selma segment, they they deal with the the law enforcement attack on marchers in Marion, Alabama. Um, there was a, a nighttime mass meeting after which they were going to try to walk the block and a half to the jail to witness for James Orange, a Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, worker who was in jail and was frankly being threatened with lynching. Uh, you know, subtle things like a noose being hung uh, just outside uh, his cell, but they got only a few feet out onto the sidewalk 
all the lights downtown were either turned off or shot out. And in, in the uh, eyes on the prize telling of this, they interview Richard Valeriani, who was NBC News correspondent. And he had been attacked, uh, the NBC camera uh, disabled. Uh, he was hit on the head and he told the interviewer, you know, I was sitting there sort of stunned and someone walked up to me and said, uh, are you hurt? And Valeriani touched the back of his head and his hand came off with blood and he said, yes, I, I think I need to see a doctor. And the person leaned in and said, we don't have doctors for people like you. Um, yeah, it was, it was scary. It was scary and yet, um, I did something during my time in Selma that a month later after Bloody Sunday would have been at least crazy, maybe suicidal. Um, after I observed the demonstrations at the courthouse, I stopped at the Chamber of Commerce, got a Selma map, and I walked out into the white residential area. I wanted, I wanted to see that as well as the black neighborhood we, where we were staying. Um, and that's where I got the pictures of the nice white houses. Um, while I was doing that, car pulled up next to me. And the woman who was driving it asked if I'd taken a picture of a house just down the street. I said, no, I, I'm pretty sure that that's one where I, I just couldn't get an angle that I thought would do it justice. Well, I'm glad it, you know, it's, it's under repair. It's not, not looking as good as I'd want it to be in a picture. Now, why, why are you here? So I, I explained very honestly who, who I was, why I was in Selma, and that I, I was in the neighborhood because I, I wanted to see all of Selma. She said, do you really want to see Selma? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, well, get, get in. Let, I've lived here all my life. My family's been here for several generations. I, I would like to show you Selma. Both of us were taking risks. She could be attacked for doing, having anything to do with one of those civil rights people. If her neighbors saw her giving a ride to this strange man, uh, I didn't know that she wasn't affiliated with the Klan or the Citizens Council. I, I, she showed me the Selma that she knew it was not as full as <laughs> all of Selma. It was a selective Selma. But I'm very glad that she offered and I said yes. Uh, I was telling Mark that uh, a month later, my friend Jim Hobart, uh, also a UU minister, uh, was part of, well, he came down after Bloody Sunday uh, stayed on for a few days and they had this uh, interesting interesting problem SCLC and SNCC had okay what do we do with these clergy who are still here and they're sort of cooped up around Brown Chapel and hmm, what do we do to do something constructive with them well, they tried to have a march to the mayor's house. Well, <laughs> that got a block and a half or two blocks and <laughs> got turned around and shoved back to Brown Chapel. Okay, an alternative. They were broken up into groups of three or four and given instructions. Uh, walk down, you know, walk left down Sylvan Street, uh, one block, 
turn right, go two blocks, turn left, go one block, turn and so on. And the intent was to have multiple little groups of three or four converge on the mayor's house. Well, Jim says that they had gotten a few blocks. They had actually gotten into the white residential area and a police car pulled up alongside them. Sergeant hops out of the passenger side, says, come on guys, you know people don't want you out here in their neighborhood. You're under arrest, get in the back seat. So they crammed into the back seat. So the sergeant got back in the passenger seat, got on the radio and said, okay, we've, we've picked up this group. I told them they're under arrest. What's the charge? Long silence. Temporary insanity. <laughs> Both the front seat and the back seat cracked up. <laughs> but it didn't feel very funny. They were held till late at night and told, okay, you can go now. And they said, uh-uh, not at night. You aren't releasing us at night. But uh, that piece of it was funny. So, any other questions? So, Gordon, you, you, you demanded to stay in jail until the morning? <laughs> Well, Jim, this, this was Jim's, Jim's situation, yeah. not, not mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we were rele released during daytime hours. Actually, I realize in retrospect, we did a couple of super bad things in getting released. Uh, actually, the whole group we were part of was released later, later on the day we got out. But uh, the three of us who were white in that group, uh, all from out of town, all yeah. white, we actually ponied up the $50 a person fine uh, and got out. You know, Ira, uh, Ira had a wife and two young children at home and had a course he was taking and he'd already missed, uh, I think two sessions of the class and didn't want to miss a third. Um, we, you know, we should not have done that. I would say in retrospect, we also should not have even talked about it without conferring with Ralph Featherstone who was, you know, nobody was in charge of our group but Ralph was the one professional civil rights worker in the group. He was a snake worker, uh, a, he was an incredibly brave and principled person. Uh, <laughs> we, we were tried as a group, we were called up for sentencing individually and I, I had something to say. The judge asked each of us, do you have anything to say? Most were smart enough not to. Uh, I was not that smart and Ralph was not that smart. When the judge here said, Ralph Featherstone. Featherstone walked up before the bench, hiked up the bit of overalls, which were sort of the snick uniform and said, your honor, where I come from in Washington, D.C., I'm accustomed to being addressed as Mr. Ralph Featherstone. The judge turned a real pretty color. It was interesting. Um, and um, a year before in the 64 Freedom Summer, Ralph Featherstone was the civil rights worker who opened the first Freedom House in Neshoba County in Philadelphia. 
they opened the Freedom House on the same day that the bodies of the three civil rights workers who had been murdered there were found in the earthen dam. Yeah. Anyhow, we didn't, we didn't confer with Ralph Featherstone about what we were contemplating. We didn't get his wisdom. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Quite dumb. So. Young white. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, How old were you, Gordon? I was 25 years old. Wow. I'm just recalling the civil rights demonstrations when I was in high school in 63 that in front of the theater downtown mm -hmm. and the and the procession of cars coming by uh, while the uh, people were demonstrating in front of the Tennessee theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put in the chat uh, a book about it's a first hand account of uh, the sit ins and uh, era of the civil rights movement. If people are interested, yeah, I've got but, my own copy with church members underlined. So yes. <laughs> it's part of uh, keeping track of the history of the church with the civil rights movement. So. Yes, that's that's an important, uh, important document for anybody in Knoxville to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see, you know, we're going to have to cut off pretty soon here, but I see uh, Jackie uh, asked me what I said to the judge. And um, I said that um, I was there as an American citizen who believed in voting rights, as did President Johnson, who had just spoken about the importance of voting rights. And I was there not as an outsider, but as somebody who did have an ancestor buried there in Selma. And the judge asked me if I, I don't know how he knew about my profession, but he asked me if I preached civil disobedience to my congregation in Boston. Fortunately, my last Sunday in the pulpit before the trip, I'd taken care of that. So I could say, yes, your honor. And it was one of those historic Boston pulpits that had uh, 120 years earlier been filled by Theodore Parker. You know, the chalice lighting song uh, used in the service this morning, what? Let ours be a faith like, that like sunshine goes everywhere. Those are words of the Reverend Theodore Parker, who was a transcendentalist and abolitionist and one of the leading American preachers in his day. I was serving with the, I was following Ken McLean in serving the Theodore Parker Unitarian Church. Wow. So, you know, some, some good heritage there. So, thank you all for your, your patience. Thank you. And thank uh, you. It was, I enjoyed putting this together for us. And where Rock, can I put, thank you so much? Can you get those notes that Chris just mentioned? You said they're in the chat. Are those available later somewhere? Oh, yeah, that, you know, when you go off. Yeah. Well, I can, I can, you know, he gives you the, the Amazon connection to the book. I could, I could email you uh, or uh, find some other, some way to semaphore to you. Uh, the okay. book is very of a sit in. And, uh, yeah. It looks too like this is being recorded. Is it? Is it um, that therefore okay to share with others if we had the re recording? Yes, it is okay to share with others. Okay. How, w will the recording be posted? Maybe. Where Where would we get that? 